Good afternoon. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Um, Ann and I were just talking here. I, Ann was a mentor to me in college, so we've known each other 33 years. So, yeah. So, so everything good about me is because of Ann. Everything bad about me is just me. So, <laughs> so no, it's, um, it's so much fun to be able to... to I don't know, be our discussion starters um, today with you, Anne. So, yeah, it's, it's great. So. Can we ask if folks need translation? Trans yes, if you need uh, sign language or Spanish language translation, we have both of those opportunities here for you. Anyone, anyone? You don't want me speaking Spanish, so you need the translation if you need it. So. You did such an excellent job in the last one. It's great. Y'all, we are um, going to spend the next hour and a half in conversation, hopefully. Um, we will try to start that conversation. We'll try. So, um, uh, But it's about relationships. And relationships are key. They are absolutely important. And with the, the work that I've been privileged to do here in San Antonio, I have realized that poverty is actually the lack of relationships. Poverty is the lack of relationships. So we might think poverty is the lack of, of financial wherewithal, right? Like they can't make their rent, um, can't pay your, your phone bill, electric bill, gas bill, water bill, that kind of thing. Um, uh, poverty is unemployment. Poverty is um, lack of health care. Um, and it is all of that, right? And, and the list goes on and on. Uh, lack of food, lack of clothing, etc. But all of that, I believe, is a result of a lack of relationships. So, uh, for instance, would be um, when I was a kid, um, I was a competitive swimmer um, training for the 1992 Olympics. So, um, swimming a lot and um, hungry all the time. Um, I would eat, you know, thousands of dollars of food a month, right? Um, and I remember my father was unemployed for a while, and I came home and um, from swim practice, famished, you know, starving, as you know, teenagers would say. I've never starved in my life, but I was starving. And um, I opened the refrigerator, and it was completely empty. We had eaten everything. And so I went to my mother and asked her where you know dinner was, and she said. Um, there's a casserole on the counter that the church had brought us. If we had not had our family relationship with the church, we would not have had food that night, right? And so that's what I mean by a poverty of relationships. And so when, when I was called to come to Christ Episcopal Church, we um, had a food pantry and have had a food pantry for 28 years, I believe it has been now, um, which is a long time. And um, they had started a program called Sidewalk Saturday, which kind of was uh, um, some services around the food pantry. And, and when I was called to be one of the associate priests at the church, the rector, the lead pastor, said to me, who's a dear friend, he said, I'd like you to um, help the ministry of Sidewalk Saturday and our food pantry be less transactional and more transformational. I was like, wow, that really spoke to me, right? And so we've been doing that work and, and, um, and it's been really interesting. The, the moment that it shifted for us was when we um, received food from Daily Bread Ministries, which is a food bank for Christian churches, and there's no restrictions to it. They don't get food from the federal government. They don't get food from agencies that, that tell you how to distribute the food. And so we put the food out on a table and let people choose their food. So we have food from the food bank that we have to put into a bag and it has to be the same for everyone because of federal regulations. And we're fine with that. But we wanted to give people the opportunity to choose and they, they then were able to do that. And that built almost immediately a trust and a dignity um, and honor within the community we were serving to where now it's not um, us serving them or them being served, it's us. It's just us. Um, 
and it was about this time last year where um, some of the folks from the community said, could we have a worship service? And I said, sure, <laughs> you know, um, not knowing what they would want and that kind of thing. And so we began that road of conversation. And, um, you know, and, and so in the Episcopal Church, we have Eucharist or Holy Communion, Lord's Supper, the sacrament every Sunday. And they actually used that language. They said, we'd like Eucharist every Saturday morning. I said, wow, you know, that's pretty fabulous, you know, to think about that. And, um, and so we figured out a way to, to do that. And we've been worshiping now together for over a year and um, on Saturday mornings for those that want to worship with us. Um, and it's been a really interesting community builder. Um, we've had a, a wedding. We've had a funeral. We've had five baptisms. We're having a wedding in a couple more weeks, another one. Um, and uh, Sidewalk Saturday has become Sidewalk Saturday Church for many people. And, um, and it's through that relational quality that um, for many folks, this is their only uh, place throughout the week where they get choice. Think about that. Only place throughout the week that they get choice and where they have community and where they trust one another. And um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about relationships, is building those relationships. And it alleviates poverty. We've been able to learn about where people are in their life and how we then can partner with them to help them attain their goals because they're willing to share that with us. So I have a story to share. Um, but first of all, my name is Ann Helmke, and I've met some of you, but not all of you. And I'm the faith liaison with the city of San Antonio. And so uh, when I was a kid and I was getting ready for the swimming Olympics, uh, <laughs> I did not Why are we see laughing? That could have, that's true, isn't it? Isn't no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time I've heard that story. And, you know, we've known each other 33 years. That's and right. I'm like, how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> you know, getting ready for the Olympics. What? <laughs> No, I was not a gymnast. Volleyball. <laughs> no. Because you're I'm so tall. Because I'm so <laughs> So, this is also a very good example of relationship. <laughs> it really is, right? And um, my story that I have to share isn't quite as long as, not that yours was long. Mine's kind of short. But before I was the faith liaison with the city, um, I was the director of spiritual services at Haven for Hope. And I started doing that in 2010, and then moved to the city in 2017. And um, so, and I had not done that particular kind of work before. I've done um, kind of multi-faith community organizing for 33 years, as long as I've known Justin. And, um, and so that's why, I think that's why I was hired at Haven for Hope, but I had not done that particular type of work before, right? But my role is to get, you know, other congregations and people of faith and community coming and being a part of that larger relationship with those who do not have permanent shelter in their lives, right? Um, my first really strong learning when I was there, other than it, it was a lot of work. I mean, it was like, that was my first realization, my first learning, was that there was absolutely no difference between me and anyone else there, except for one thing. Relationships. If I were to be homeless, I would, you know, go to Justin. And my support system, all of my relationships, I would go to Julie. I would go, that my relationships would not allow me to be homeless. Right? They would stop it, somehow. And I'm really blessed to have those kinds of relationships and a quantity of them. But at Haven, I never found anybody that was staying there who had relationships. In fact, 
they had most cases the reverse as in they had been disowned by their family so I don't know what you call not having a relationship but like in the negative zone right what is there a word for that I don't know and and it's 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 like tragic poverty poverty you know like it's mm. almost shameful you know that and and every story you know uh, well do you have family no well do you have you been no there wasn't one person I met there that relationships was the thing that that poverty and um, one of the things that we did, um, especially during winter months, um, and I don't have the statistics in my head anymore, but people who are homeless don't live as long, literally, as other people who have homes. Like, I, I wanna say it's like 25 to 30 years. You know, it's a lot. And um, so we would have, I would have like a memory memorial service once a month uh, for the deaths that would happen during that month and um, it, because it was so obvious that um, they were alone they were abandoned and um, or they felt that way and probably were in many cases right but part of that time that we would be together it was really their time you know I would just invite people to we would say names and we wouldn't just read them we just we would do kind of like one person at a time and we would you know say Justin right and Justin right and then people would tell me continually you know I feel so much better now because I know if I die while I'm here somebody's gonna say my name out loud one more time think about that and then I would invite people who would gather because they lived with them or they were you know the social worker or navigator or people that knew the people who had died and I would just say you know if you want to say a few words if you want it whatever you know you can people would sing songs you know they would about the you know in honor of that person or I mean they were just it was amazing the prayers they would tell a memory they might read a, a, some poetry whatever storytelling but it was just the whole the name thing was huge and those memorial services we also did that if we had deaths on in staff or within partners we did the same thing exactly the same thing and those were our largest services when we would have these memory times because there was something that resonated with everybody right and then when we'd say those names you know you could feel it and um, my last session was in here and it was on compassion and connection so I want to this wasn't in our plan but I'm gonna say, no. share this part <laughs> but um, when saying those names like I said, and I bet you know what I'm talking about. I could feel the energy, you know, Justin. And there was, it was like, you could just, you could feel it. Well, in neuroscientific research, um, in the last, I would say 20, 20 years, something like that, they've been doing a lot of research on compassion. One, they have found that compassion is literally in our DNA. Right? So we're created with this thing going. And, um, and they've also done, have done a lot of study around the energy, human energy. So I defined it the last one, I'm gonna do it again here. But um, generally people, when we start talking about compassion, they're like, what do you mean by compassion? What does that mean? What's that definition? Because there are a lot of perceptions, we are our own life experiences, could probably be in as many things as there are people, right? But um, what we're gonna kind of work with today, and it comes with affirmation by neuroscientific research 
on wisdom that is ancient within religions, right? That we have this about us and this capacity and uh, woven in all of that is the golden rule or the ethic of reciprocity. That's how we do better together by caring for each other the way we wish to be cared for and not harming someone in ways that we would never want to be harmed, right? So that naming is that golden rule. Naming someone the way we wish that somebody will remember us and say our name, right? So the part that I wanna define a little bit because I think it'll help us be in sync with what we're about to do um, is that that same research has discovered that when we empathize, when we are empathetic, or maybe we experience it, right? There is an energy flow between two people or more, could be, but you know, like if Justin were hurting in some way, suffering, there was no food in the fridge, <laughs> um, but suffering some way, and, and I could feel it, like I, I get that, you know? And if you think about it a little bit, when you see somebody suffering, you can also even feel the energy a little bit. But the science shows us that there is an energy flow that goes towards Justin, the one who's suffering. So that energy flow, you need it because you're suffering, but it, it comes out of this body. So when we talk about compassion fatigue, it's a misnomer. It's empathy fatigue. So it, it takes energy away from us. And if we're continually doing that, like people would be doing at Haven for Hope, there was a lot of fatigue there, right? Now, compassion work can be hard work, and it is, and it takes energy, and you can be tired, right? But it's not that fatigue and energy drain. Compassion, on the other hand, in that science, tells us that compassion has a sense of agency like you can do something about it. You can take some action. So if Justin is suffering and, and, and I'm feeling it, then he's feeling that energy, right? And we commiserate or whatever those next steps might be, if one of us said, or both of us say something like, well, you know, like, you know, like what if we met more often? Once a month, right? What if we met more often? you know, might that help? See, little idea, right? And then you'll notice when something like that happens inside yourself, it, there's a little spark. That spark is energy, literally. So compassion creates energy within the human body. Empathy requires energy. Compassion creates it. So you know when you're in those zones. I mean, I can work forever, sometimes I think. I can work forever as long as I'm working on compassion because it's just like fueling me, right? But there is at some point in the day where I'm like, oh, I gotta go to bed, you know? But I'm not fatigued. I'm not getting depressed from it because that's what happens with fatigue. So what we wanna invite you to do now is uh, Pair and share. I heard that term at the last workshop. I hadn't heard that before. Pair and share. And I want to invite you to find somebody to pair with that you have not met before. Now, you don't have to, but I'm going to encourage you. Because you're going to hear something that you've not heard before, right? If you're paired with a friend, you're most likely going to go back into, oh, I'm going to talk to this guy about swimming Olympics. What? That's not about it. Anyway, I want to invite you to share a story from each of you right, about poverty, the lack of relationship, and or where you felt rich because of relationship, where relationship, you know, filled your life. And you might not have had a penny in your pocket, right? So if you could just think of a short story Find another person and you each share that story. Where you felt that poverty, no relationship, or where you experienced the fullness of a relationship. 
the richness. All right. All right, if I can have your attention. All right, all right, all right. You want me to do it? Hello, hello, hello. Do, Come on back. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. All right. I'm so glad y'all don't like to talk. I mean, that's just wow. Wow. I went out for chocolate and I came back and it was a bug. That's right. It's great. What we'd like to do now is if two of you would volunteer to share a portion of what you shared, not what the other person shared with you, right? Like you're not you're not sharing what they shared, but share your story that you shared with them. Just a reminder, we're, we're not in therapy here, right? <laughs> this is not a support group. Um, we just simply want to hear your story, right, that you shared, if you are so inclined. And if you'd like to do that, you can come on down. Yeah, come on down. And um, I'll give you the microphone, and you can... Yeah, we want to hear you, so, yeah. So, all right, and your first name is? Rebecca. Rebecca. So let's give Rebecca a warm round of applause. Yes. There we go. Um, so my name is Rebecca, and I was sharing with the person I was partnered with that I graduated high school in Mexico, so I got here to San Antonio in 2020. Um, so I didn't know anybody when I got here, except for my family. So when I tried to get into school, I didn't know how to because I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any <coughs> friends here. So, and since I'm a first-gen student, they didn't know how to help me either because most of my family didn't go to college or didn't finish school at all. And so it was hard for me to navigate on how to find the resources, how to find the college, how to apply and everything. But once I found the organization I am in, they, also, they helped me apply for college, find, they helped me find a job, they helped me get health, uh, health insurance, get my driver's license. And so now that I met them, they connected me with other people and now, from being alone with the poverty of relationships, now I am. I feel that I'm surrounded and hugged with all of these relationships that can help me. <laughs> and that's my story. What's the name of the organization? Oh, it's uh, Next Level Youth Opportunity Center. Ah. Yay. It serves youth ages, oh sorry, 16 to 24. Yeah. And we recently created a, a board, so it is led by youth. I am the co-lead, which is the vice president, and we always try to get the members to participate more in the events and get connected with other resources as well. Great. Yes. Yeah. Woo. I just have to add to this. Next Level is a program of the Department of Human Services of the city of San Antonio, where I serve. Is that crazy that the city would do something as compassionate as that? Hi. I'd like to share um, that the, I, my, under, to my understanding was um, how relationships felt unhealthy or yeah. disconnected. You felt poverty, caused poverty, okay. Um, for me, um, I was just sharing that um, in a 30-year marriage, military, moving uh, 18, 18 times, uh, my spouse uh, alienated um, my children and I from connection, from family, yet he um, said that what attracted him to me was that I had such a huge family. Uh, come to find out that in the United States, he had way more family than me, but had burned those bridges a long time ago. So um, little by little, um, I was, uh, we, my, my kids and I weren't, um, um, even he wouldn't bring work home, he wouldn't share his friendships, uh, he had a very professional career, he wouldn't uh, involve us in any of that. If he was invited to cookouts, the celebrations, this and that, he never took us there as a family, so little by little, like I said, he just um, um, separated us and alienated us, so that la lack of um, connections, lack of relationships, um, caused, um, caused poverty, deep, deep in our hearts, deep, deep in my children's heart. Um, so that poverty caused illnesses that manifested themselves, um, and that poverty um, sent um, at least me in a downward spiral where I was practically circling the drain. Um, but the positive side of it, a program such as NAMI, I could be a poster child for them, um, have um, 
help me, help me find the words, the vocabulary to be able to express what actually happened to me, recognize what has happened to me, and move into advocacy. Hope this blesses somebody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more, someone? I saw a hand go up first over there, so yeah, come on down. Next time. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Vicki, and this is my partner Felicia over here. Um, and we found that we had a lot in common because we had deep poverty from family issues when we were younger. So uh, whether they were from separations, death, whatever. So we found that we had that lack of uh, friendships and connection and stuff as, as children. As we got older, we did reach out. We have other uh, rich relationships now. And I just want you guys to know that this is the first year Felicia's celebrating her birthday with 10 of her friends tonight. So can we sing happy birthday to her? Come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Felicia. Happy birthday to you. And we're both nurses, so we can't fix our own problems, but we'll put a Band-Aid on yours. <laughs> wow. Okay, that was orchestrated. We knew that we were going to sing happy birthday today. So, no. so um, in relationships, uh, we, as we were talking to plan for um, this conversation, we, we began to think about what, what is it that all of us are really needing and hungry for? And a few things that we came up with were that we are seen and known. Think about that. I think every human being wants to be seen and known. So it's not just, not just making eye, can't, eye contact on the street with somebody, but it's actually to stop and talk to them, right? Um, so seen and known, to belong. Now you might say, well, belong to what? Well, that's for you to decide, right? To belong, um, uh, whatever that may look like. And then the other characteristic we thought of was to uh, be loved and to love, right? So it's, it's, it's important to be loved, but it's also important for us to then extend that love back out. So, so known and seen, seen and known, belong to be loved and to love. Does that ring kind of true, you think? Yeah? Yeah. It, um, at, at Christ Church, at one of the areas that I oversee is our outreach, and we have an extensive outreach uh, ministry to our schools. Um, we've adopted two elementary schools that then feed into a middle school that we've adopted that then feed into a high school that we've adopted. Um, and what that means is we uh, work on providing tutors and mentors and food and um, at the two elementary schools, if you get perfect attendance, you get a bicycle at the end of the year. Um, I mean, so some pretty, pretty, <laughs> I know, woo, woo, yeah. Um, I'm, and I have the honor of going to these um, great assemblies at the end of the year and handing kids bikes. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's my job is to hand out the bikes. So are you the bike guy? I'm the bike guy. So um, the last time I handed up bikes, um, I kid you not, every single dad that was there. Now, and, and here's the key to it. Every kid who had perfect attendance was also on the honor roll. And every kid who had perfect, this is San Antonio ISD, and every kid who uh, was on the honor roll and had perfect attendance, mom and dad both were there at the assembly. So, there could be a correlation of relationship there, right? Right. So, um, and every dad that we um, gave a bike to, their daughter or their son, um, cried. <laughs> I mean, it was literally, you know, while they're taking a picture with their phone, they're going, "Oh my God!" You know? How to make so, a grown man cry? Yeah, that's right. Give, <laughs> their give your kid a bike. How to make a grown man cry? Um, so. We, we, every other Thursday throughout the school year, we have a drive-by um, food distribution at St. Paul Roman Catholic Church. And we hand out food enough for the, that couple weeks from, from one, one Thursday to another. And these are families that have been identified by the social workers that need assistance. 
And it's not just drive in and here's your food, see you later. We get to know people. And last year, towards the end of the year, a grandmother who's raising eight of her grandkids on her own, grandmother and eight kids, pulls in, turns the car off, right? Most don't do that. Rolls down the window and we see who she is and, and our folks run over to her and, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, we're so glad to see you. She just bursts into tears. Her fourth grandchild is in fifth grade. Um, so she has eight, remember. Um, had made a comment to a girl in class that got him into the principal's office. And it was a pretty awful comment. She was vulnerable enough, we knew her well enough that she told us what the comment was. And she didn't know where to turn. And we listened to the story, we listened to her pain and her hurt. Um, we knew the backstory, we knew why she was caring for the kids and not uh, the, the parents and why she was raising them. Um, both parents were incarcerated. Um, she was seen, she was known, she felt like she belonged, she wanted to be loved, and so did we. We were able to um, help her get to a counselor the next day for her and for the grandchild. Um, and they actually showed up and, and received counseling separately and then together. Um, and, and that repaired uh, the hurt and pain that was inflicted by what the child had said with her, you know, so that repaired the hurt and pain with the grandmother. And then they had an action plan with the therapist as to how they could go back to school and repair the relationships with the school and with the young lady that, that he had said the comment to. That's the power of relationships. She had nowhere else to turn, right? Nowhere else. Um, and so you never know. You just really never know um, what you're gonna see and how you're gonna be known, how you belong, um, and how you're to love and be loved. And um, uh, I happened to not be at that distribution that night, but I got a, an email that was um, about eight paragraphs describing the events because the people that were there from Christ Church serving were so impacted by it. But they were so um, relieved that they had the resources to be able to help the individual, but also that they knew her well enough that she would actually share something so incredibly um, hurtful in her life and we wouldn't judge her and we helped her you know, find healing and restoration. Um, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, right? Mm -hmm. And I listened to that story too, and I come back to that whole energy flow, yeah. right? And so obviously this grandmother recognized along the way that they were getting energy flow, they were being supported and strengthened enough so that she could come and speak. But even those eight paragraphs that you received, they were impacted and you probably could ask them, but they probably received energy. They were, it, it, energy was produced in them because they were able to help, right? So, you know, it helps everybody. Um, it's kind of a, a we proposition. Everybody is better, right? So the grandmother, the people that served, the grandchild, a better world, right? Compassion produces that kind of thing. Um, I told Justin that I didn't really have a story for this moment, and I should probably leave it at that. But uh, that one might come to me while he was talking about seeing known, belong, loved, and to love. Um, and I also already told you that I've got this an amazing support system, right? And um, frankly, I mean, I grew up in a large family of six children, and so I've always, and gone to church, I've always kind of had a large support system. 
um, I think it's really appropriate at this conference, but there's stigma, right? Same root as stigmata, right? Stigma. So, um, a little more than 23 years ago, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but um, I was going through a divorce. And um, so I tell you, I've, I've been ordained for 33 years. So you can do the math and realize that I was um, clergy when I was going through the divorce. And I told no one. So I had to, well, when the divorce, Julie's looking at me like, what? But when I actually started going through the process, then people did. But the pain was much longer than the divorce process. In fact, my former husband was an attorney and he did all the divorce process for, the, for us, on behalf of us. I didn't go to court, nothing. He took care of it. Wow. Anyway, I told you I wasn't gonna give you details. So, I'm sorry about that one. But, um, so even in the midst of having these great, rich relationships of support, we're all human, right? And then there's these cultural things that can bind us, right? Cultural or, or things that happened to us when we were children and now they're showing themselves. I mean, just stuff, right? And every time I look back on it, I wish I'd taken some different steps. But I felt very um, disconnected. I did not then, even though I was still out and about with people and doing my thing and, and really feeling good about my work, but I didn't feel like I was being really seen or known because I wasn't letting anybody see or know me, right? And so there was this disconnect, too, of, of belonging to this support system. And, and yes, I have responsibility in that, but there's a cultural and a bunch of other stuff that goes with it, right? And especially when you're hurting and you're in pain, you can't quite see all those things, right? You can't see the fact that you're totally holding it in because there's some stigma out there that you're not supposed to be doing these things, right? And so it, it's, and I didn't feel loved in lots of different ways. And I just, it was really hard. And I think we can, I bet there are many of us who've gone through something like that, where you feel like you can't even share it with your best friend, maybe. Or your mother, or whoever it might be, you just can't tell them. And then you get into this other weird space that is not healthy. Human, but not healthy. So, we're going to invite you again to pair and share. And, um, but again, tell a story, right? Where you really have felt seen, or you've seen that, and this, like a story like Justin's, you've seen it happen. Or you really have felt it. Or you even really felt doing with somebody else. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this person, but I, I like know them now, right? Um, but even be able to encourage, it's, it's a little more vulnerable, like I just felt it, but to even tell maybe a story where you couldn't allow yourself and how hard that is and how painful. And uh, that's about naming as well. And we heard that from Mike, who was from Valdi, when he told his story and he talked about naming. It was easy for them to name because it all happened out in public, right? It was his name, 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 named everywhere with that shooting. But naming, which it doesn't have to be long, right? You know, like, I'm hurting at home. I need somebody. He also had that, what was that line about receiving and taking what we need? What was that line? Somebody remember? It was a great line. Anyway, so I invite you to pair, share, stories of seen, known, belonging, loved, and loving. <laughs> or parts and pieces. <laughs> Boy, I know people are like, what? No, just, no, it doesn't have to be all of those. So another 10 minutes?
What's the Wheel of Fortune song? I don't know the Wheel of Fortune song. Um, Here we go again. Yeah, we're going to work on it. We're going to work on it. All right, y'all, if we could come back together. <laughs> See all the energy? We're better together. Yeah, we're better together. We're better together. Yes. Everyone, everywhere, all the time. Uh, so somebody did remember the quote from the priest this morning. Give what you have and accept what you need. Give what you have and accept what you need. Great quote. So uh, if there are a couple people maybe who would be willing to share their story around that whole, not all those things I've been told, seen, known, belong, loved, and loving. You wanna come forward? <laughs> You've been voluntold. She's a part of my story. Ah, oh, okay. Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> I'm Pam Gould, and this is Christine Martinez. We work together. We do. We work oh, together. Uh, but but we didn't, didn't share. share. So so what I'm about to say. We were not has, in a group together. We yeah. were not. She has no idea what I'm going to say. So I grew up. An, a survivor of abuse and addiction in our family. Military, moving every three years, keep the secret. Um, so never had close relationships, was never real with anyone. But in the past three years, in the team that we've grown and developed, I'm able to be the real me. I'm able to share what's really going on with me without fear of judgment or shame or boredom or any of that. And Christine and the rest of our team, there's 14 of us, we're a family. We are family. So I wanted to share that I wanted to make sure Christine was here with me. Oh. That's awesome. Oh. Yay. Wow, that's like standing ovation stuff, right? Wow. <laughs> um, is there someone else? Yeah, top that one. Come on down. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. Hi there. Hello. My name's Destiny. Um, I'm a therapist out in Floresville, if any of you know where that is. <laughs> it's southeast of here. Um, yeah, so... Therapist in I am one of like four of us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's not many. It's a very rural community. Um, yeah, and so I shared with my partner that um, in the last year, I have done a lot of healing work related to my own inner judgments and biases around being a person of color, being a Latina. And um, through that, it has given me so much courage to start showing up in spaces where I'm usually the only person of color, um, but I have never acknowledged it until last week, actually. Um, and I've been doing this work for like seven years, so uh, a little bit. And last week, we had a group training at the facility that I work at in Floresville, and the facilitator asked what we wanted to get out of it. And um, yeah, it was the first time I had brought up in front of our group that um, I wanted to be seen as a person of color. And I am the only person of color on our team. And it was super scary, just as scary as it is right now, looking at all of you <laughs> saying the same thing. Um, but yeah, it needed to happen. And I shared with my partner that um, the reason why I shared that, first of all, is because I felt so safe with my team, just like you, to share it. And um, without even any expectation, my team just immediately thanked me for shining a light on it. And then also immediately was like, how can we show up for you today? Like, what are we gonna do? And it was just so moving and impactful and um, 
it was beautiful and I haven't felt as seen in that way as a Latina really ever in my professional career and it's pretty powerful when you do that for people of color so <laughs> wow wow I think we need to move on. I see his watch. We're going towards 20 till. Um, I'm going to hand it back to you. Sounds good. In um, the agenda for the conference, we had some questions that were written there. It, it came out from the Harvard Flourishing Conference that they have. Um, and so if you're interested in that, Harvard Flourishing is what you can Google search. Um, and they have six major areas of um, our lives that need to flourish in order for us to flourish. Right? That's a lot of flourishing in one sentence. But um, Harvard says it much uh, more succinctly and beautifully because they're Harvard, and I am not Harvard. Um, but they said deeply connected and trusting friendships and relationships are key to us feeling healthy, thriving, and flourishing. Right? And so we've, we've experienced that um, over the last hour. But the questions that they ask us to think about are, are you content with your friendships and relationships? So the ones that you have, are they really feeding you um, and, and helping you and that kind of thing? Are your relationships satisfying? How do, you, how do we develop peer-to-peer -peer relationships and how can we be companions along the way for each other? I added that one, so they didn't, Harvard didn't have that one. So, but I was thinking in the way of mental health space as well as the spiritual life, the physical life, intellectual life, um, emotional life, spiritual life, you know, um, we do need companions along the way. So what we'd like to do is um, just open the floor until two o'clock and um, if people have ideas about these questions, thoughts about these questions, what we're, what we're hoping is that um, you might have something specific to share with us that we can take um, and do for ourselves or take into our communities in which we live and do in our communities. So, um, so it's yes to all the questions, right? Yes, those are important. But then, okay, well, how how do we take those? Like, what's our action plan, right? Um, love is a verb, right? Belonging is a verb. Seeing and known, those are verbs. Like, what do we do to? Um, uh, to be seen and to be known, right? And so we just heard, you know, stand up and say, you know, this is what I need, this is who I am. Um, that was powerful. Um, but how can we help others um, find their voice, right? And, and share that in that same way. And how can we help others have the courage um, for the, the people that have shared today their stories and the ones you've heard with each other. So what have we gleaned or learned from all of this conversation today that we can uh, maybe discover some universal truths about relationships that we can take with us out into this world um, that seems to be uh, broken. Relationships are broken, right? And so how can we redeem that in some way? Yeah. So let's just take a deep breath, right? Um, and think for a moment about those questions. And they are written in your printed agenda, so if you wanna see them and read them. Yes. Come, yeah. You wanna have to Come on down, yeah, so we can get you on camera. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> We're recording. We're recording. We want this to go out to the millions of people who will watch this. Uh, I think I just changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, I changed my mind. The thousands too. of people. Sorry. sorry. Um, so this was unexpected. Uh, the session and, and what came up in our discussions. Um, but I. Um, so my youngest two children have been hospitalized 15 times in the last seven years, and then everything in between inpatients um, for mental health. And um, then my husband disappeared after 30 years and we went through the pandemic. So it's been a little rough. <laughs> um, but as a person who has the ability to make friends very easily and take care of everybody else, it was um, the <clears throat> loneliest time ever. 
and even being a part of planting the church and just building up that resentment, like where is everybody? And so I think um, just what I'd like to share, as you all well know, um, <clears throat> the mental health journey is very private. <laughs> um, divorce can be very shameful, especially when you're a leader in the church. And um, <clears throat> the trauma-informed session, I think it was yesterday morning, was really helpful too, because we just have to assume, no matter how anybody looks, they're going through it. They're going through something. And so, um, as far as friendships and connection goes, what I realized pretty quickly is, especially during the pandemic, nobody had space to hear what I was going through. They had their own stuff. Everybody was dealing with their own stuff. Um, and I had to get super clear about what I needed from who. Uh, praying hands and emojis wasn't cutting it. <laughs> um, from my family. Um, and that happened again just a few weeks ago when my daughter overdosed, praying hands and hearts. And I'm like, it's not what I need. Um, so not just letting yourself be known and seen and verbal vomiting everything going on, but trying to figure out exactly what you need has been the biggest takeaway the last several years of saying, look, this is the financial situation. This is my emotional state. This is, you know, really what I need more than anything is, you know, to be able to have somebody to give me some relief so I can work and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's the takeaway I wanted to share. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And what I heard in that too is to have the strength and courage to say those things, mm -hmm. you know, and and then on the other side of that same coin, to be as supportive as we possibly can when you know somebody's about to say it, right? Yeah. Be there. Mm -hmm. Be there. Yes, ma'am. Come on down. Come on down. Hi everyone, I'm Linda, and I Hi, uh, Linda. <laughs> tis a good thing. I am a former foster mom of eight children who came through my home, and I adopted one uh, just four years ago. He's now 16, and um, I've discovered the power of chosen family in our relationships, and so. My adopted son, his sister, was also with me as a foster, but went on to residential. And um, we're all back together now. We met each other five years ago, and she has a little one. But through these children, I've met other young people that are now part of my little posse and chosen family of kids that have come out of foster care that still don't have care. I met uh, a young lady and her partner in the delivery room of my former foster daughter who shared and opened up about them being homeless and living out of their car. And so I resourced and learned about the youth element of Haven of Hope. They didn't choose to do that, but they've stayed connected with me. And the power of chosen family and hospitality yes. go hand in hand. For example, I gave um, my former daughter's, uh, foster daughter's partner, a birthday party. And it was just gonna be three of us. But then it grew to a party of 11 in two <laughs> hours. And it was more of the family, their generational families. And after the birthday party, um, the one who gave the party for us said, I have never had a party with people, this many people for me before. So I'm just, enjoying the joy of a chosen family. I have one sister in Indiana and a brother in South America, but I have a chosen family and it keeps enlarging through hospitality because I love to have these young people over. So I share that. Thank you. It reminds me that the, the that root of hospitality is hospital and the, the healing that you find in hospitality. Mm. Some, another? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the person who's running the recording. That's right. 
She just pushed pause. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all better not tell because I'm working. Oh, hey, look, there's my boss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, just it's working. It's working. <laughs> no, okay. I just wanted to share that. Um, She's still videoing. Yeah, she still I am. Is. I yeah. am. <laughs> um, so I'm a speech therapist and I'm also an educator. And one thing I will say in all of my experience, all of it across the board, home health, clinic, in school, over Zoom, um, people won't tell you anything if they don't feel like you're going to hear them. You can't see them until they allow you to see them, but you have to hear them first. And how do you hear somebody? You can't judge them. And I think that as humans, we have to realize that, at least in my experience, the way, maybe I'm autistic, I don't know. I feel like that's, that's something that I am working through on my own, which is not a, a bad thing, actually. It's an amazing thing. Um, but I think that if you were to look at your thinking in the sense of an evolution, right? Like you see money on the floor, it's your first instinct to maybe say, hey, I found some money on the floor, it's mine, I'm gonna take it, right? Somebody else may think that's evil. Somebody else may think, hey, you're, out, you're you got lucky. It's all about perception and it's all about the way you're choosing to see that situation and how somebody else sees you in that situation. So that being said, if we were to just let ourselves be human and understand that we all have those initial thought thoughts, I guess, that may not seem favorable, favorably viewed by somebody else, it's still part of the thought process. It's still part of the evolution of I should not do that because, and then you continue to evolve that thinking until you do whatever you feel in your spirit is the right thing to do, right? So being able to have these conversations with kiddos um, when I'm in the classroom, I let them see me be wrong. I let them see me make mistakes and then I apologize and I go through it with them as to what I did, how I could have prepared better. Um, and I can't tell you how many times that gets even the one that doesn't want to sit down, you know, to do, a, like really good work so basically all that to say is if you can just let people say what they're going to say whether you agree with it or not and understand that that's just a phase of an evolution of understanding that they're in and if you give them grace um, and you let them continue on and help them help guide them to the higher evolutionary point of view i guess of that situation for themselves you have helped them you you help them help themselves and not only that but now they won't go and do that thing again because now they've truly gained wisdom. And that helps in speech therapy, that helps in any kind of therapy, I'm sure, you know, just being, just being able to be heard and know that you're not going to be judged by it. So, and that's hard to do. We hear things all the time that we don't agree with, but realizing that you were there one time. At some point, whether somebody was watching or not, we've all been there, and giving ourselves that, um, that space, I guess, to um, understand that we're gonna be there again. It's a lifelong process, and the more that we continue to act as if we don't make mistakes, and the more that we continue to act as if um, we're past that, and we, um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, we'll never get past it. We'll never get past it, and I think that you become a better person the more you realize how wrong you are. And me, personally, I'm wrong all the time, and that's what I tell everybody. I'm wrong, okay, I'm fine. I'm not gonna argue with you about it. You can prove how right you are, and I'll learn something. How about that, you know? So, there's always things around, like, you know, we're gonna bump heads with knowledge and things like that, but there are always ways to get around understanding, and there's always something to learn from that other person, so. Sorry, they lost my job. <laughs> so, Billy, is she going to get a bonus for that? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Some of you might know that um, I started a journey about uh, two and a half years ago with Parkinson's disease. I was diagnosed in June two years ago. And um, when I shared that with my son, who at the time was uh, 23 years old, I think, maybe 22. This is what he said. Dad, I got your back. He goes, you've cared for me for 22 years. It's my turn to care for you. And he goes, when I call, I'm going to tell you whether I'm calling for advice, right? Because he still does that, which is really fantastic. But he goes, if I'm calling to check in on you, I'm going to call and say, this is your check-in call. <laughs> right? So then, then he checks in, right? He has done that for two and a half years. And um, 
it's really fantastic, y'all, when you're in an, um, which I think probably most of us are, are in some kind of profession or, um, or even maybe it, compassion is just part of our life in what we do. You probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't part of who you are, and it is a part of everyone, but we've tapped into it, right? We, we're here because we want to learn how to be better at it and how to be more compassionate. Um, so we give of ourselves a lot, right? Um, I'm a priest in the Episcopal Church, and I am listening to other people's stories and walking along their road with them quite often, and then to have your own son turn and say, I'm going to walk with you, whew, man. It is powerful and meaningful. He got married this summer and um, 24 years old and we were on a father-son trip and he goes, Dad, am I too young to get married? And I said, well, and I thought about it. I said, no, because I was 24 when I got married. I said, this is great, you know, so. Um, perfect age. Perfect age, you're, you're right on target. Um, he asked me to be dad for the weekend rather than the priest of the wedding. And I totally agreed. I was like, you know, with what's going on in my physical life. And, um, and he goes, and dad, you get too stressed out over leading liturgy. Like, I, I want you to enjoy this wedding and not be stressed out over it. I'm like, you, whose kid are you, moms, right? Um, so at the end of the Episcopal liturgy, there's the blessing of the marriage. And um, my son's godfather, who is a priest, was the one officiating. He got to hold, Koval is my son's name, he got to hold Koval when he was two, two hours old and then got to officiate a wedding 24 years later of, of that young man. He, Koval grabs the microphone from Stephen and turns to the congregation and says, many of you know that my dad is an Episcopal priest. We asked him to be dad for the wedding, but dad, guess what, surprise. <laughs> Would you come forward and offer the final blessing? <laughs> And um, man, there are moments like that in our lives all the time, right? Um, when we give of ourselves so often, it, um, it's hard to see those because we're, we're the ones giving and giving and giving and giving. But man, when it comes back in such major ways, <laughs> it blows you over. Um, but that, that opportunity not only my son calling me um, every 10 to 10 days to two weeks um, to see how I am, that opportunity to receive his grace and love and the opportunity then to bless his marriage and have asked God to bless his marriage. I didn't bless it, God did. Um, I will carry that with me all the time. And when I struggle to wake up in the morning and tie my shoes because of the Parkinson's, I'm reminded of my son. I'm reminded of the people who are praying and offering help and my circle of friendship and relationships and um, and that's what keeps me going. That's the power of relationships that we're talking about, right? And um, so thank you for that and thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to share something? Yeah, okay. now, what time is it? We're just keeping track of time because we don't want to. This is our last one. Okay. My name is Janie, and I'm a mental health advocate. And I had to divorce my dysfunctional family. And my family of choice comes from mental health groups. I belong to NAMI, Greater San Antonio, Dipolar and Depression Support Alliance San Antonio, and the Prosumers. I'm involved in different activities, including support groups. We participate not as pro credentialed professionals, but we, so we provide support from our own experiences. People come in and different needs. And those of us are further along and doing better show an example, but we're careful to explain where we were or we haven't been doing this well. And as people take courage to show up and we acknowledge that, and people who are courageous enough to come back, we build those relationships and people come back and come back and they grow and they get better. And these relationships allow people to flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful. And I've built 
great family from this. And there are many people helping put on this convention. And people, I got so many hugs post COVID, it's wonderful. And that's all I'm going to say is uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Do y'all remember from this morning, we're better together, everyone, everywhere, all the time. Let's say it together. Better together, everywhere, everyone, all the time. Would it be too much to ask if you would give a blessing for us? I would love to do that. Okay. I will offer God's blessing upon us. God of many names and many attributes, God bless us. God walk before us. God shower down upon us your love, your grace, your compassion, your forgiveness, and lead the way. God walk behind us and pick us up when we fall and when we fail. Rise up in us so that we may rise with your strength and power. And God, walk beside us as a companion along the road so that we can be a companion to others. God, nourish us so that we can nourish others. God, love us so we can love others. We are better together with you and with one another. May we have a strong relationship with you, O oh God, and with each other. And may you lead the way. Amen. Amen. The plenary starts at 2.10. You might think 2.15 because that's been our regular pattern. 2.10. And you do want to come to the final plenary. It's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. <laughs>